life processes all living things are made up of cells if we observe the cells of an organism we can find that there is a continuous movement of molecules into the cell and out of the cell cells need molecules to get energy and to build new complex molecules in the same way cells need to send out the waste molecules that are generated during their metabolic activities so a continuous inward and outward movement of molecules is required for a cell to survive organisms like plants and animals are made up of millions of cells then how do supply of new molecules to these cells and removal of waste molecules from these cells takes place which processes help the organisms to do this difficult job life processes are a set of processes that help the organisms to do this job the processes that help the organisms to maintain and repair their bodies are called life processes nutrition respiration transportation and excretion are the four important life processes that help the organisms in their survival nutrition all living organisms need food to live but the way by which they obtain their food is different in different animals the way of obtaining food digestion and absorption of food comes under nutrition so nutrition is the first and most important life process types of nutrition 1 autotrophic nutrition 2 heterotrophic nutrition let us see autotrophic nutrition autotrophic nutrition is the process by which green plants algae and some bacteria make their own food using simple inorganic substances like carbon dioxide and water with sunlight as the energy source autotrophic nutrition in plants plants make glucose by using simple inorganic materials like water carbon dioxide in presence of sunlight and with the help of chlorophyll this process is called photosynthesis during this process organisms also produce oxygen which is very important for the survival of the organisms here we can see the chemical equation of photosynthesis 6co2 plus 12h2o gives rise to c6h12o6 that is glucose plus 6o2 that is oxygen plus 6h2o that is water so this reaction takes place in presence of sunlight and with the help of chlorophyll plants use this glucose for their energy requirements the remaining glucose is converted into starch and stored in different parts for future use oxygen is released out into the atmosphere so from this equation we can understand that the raw materials or reactants of this reaction are carbon dioxide and water the products are glucose and oxygen and the conditions and apparatus required are sunlight and chlorophyll let us see how plants acquire their raw materials plants obtain carbon dioxide through tiny pores called stomata located on the surface of leaves leaves play a major role in exchange of gases in plants however gas exchange also occurs across the surface of stems roots and other parts of the plant to prevent excessive water loss plants regulate the opening and closing of stomatal pores when carbon dioxide is not needed for photosynthesis the plant closes these pores this regulation is controlled by specialized cells called god cells present in this stomata when god cells absorb water they swell causing the stomatal pore to open in the same way when they lose water they get shrink and the pore closes this mechanism helps the plants to efficiently manage gas exchange and water conservation this is how plants get carbon dioxide let us see how do they get the other materials plants get water from the soil through roots plants get the light through the surface of the leaf water carbon dioxide chlorophyll and sunlight if any one of the components is missing plants cannot carry out photosynthesis let us verify it with some activities variegated leaf experiment 
By this experiment, we can prove that chlorophyll is important for photosynthesis. For this, take a potted plant with variegated leaves, such as money plant or croton plant. Place the plant in dark room for 3 days to deplete all the stored starch. After 3 days, expose the plant to sunlight for approximately 6 hours. Pluck a leaf from the plant and identify the green areas on it. Trace these green areas onto a sheet of paper. Boil the leaf in water for few minutes to soften it. Transfer the boiled leaf into beaker filled with alcohol. Set up a water bath and place the beaker containing the leaf and alcohol into it. Heat until the alcohol begins to boil. Now, take out the leaf and submerge the leaf in a dilute solution of iodine for few minutes. Now, remove the leaf from the iodine solution and rinse it off. The green areas of the leaf turns dark blue. Iodine when reacts with starch, it produces dark blue color. That means in the green areas of leaf, photosynthesis took place due to the presence of chlorophyll. And in the non-green areas of the leaf, there is no photosynthesis due to the absence of chlorophyll. Similarly, we have another activity to show that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. For this, select two healthy potted plants of similar size. Place both the plants in dark room for three days. Now place a watch glass containing potassium hydroxide to absorb the carbon dioxide next to one plant. Cover both the plants with separate bell jars and use Vaseline to seal the bottom to ensure an airtight setup. Expose both plants to sunlight for about 2 hours. Pluck a leaf from each plant and perform a starch test as described earlier. Now compare the presence and amount of starch in both the leaves. The plant kept with potassium hydroxide has very less starch as compared to the plant without potassium hydroxide. This shows that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis. Location and Mechanism of Photosynthesis Photosynthesis takes place in the special organelles called chloroplast present inside the green leaves. Let us find their exact location inside the leaf. This is the cross section of the leaf. Here we can observe some cells with green dot like structures. These green dot like structures are the chloroplasts. A chloroplast has two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. The inner membrane is called grana. It is folded and forms stacks of sacs like structures called thylakoids. Chlorophyll is the green color pigment present in these thylakoids. The space between the grana and the outer membrane is called stroma. Photosynthesis is very complex process and it involves so many reactions in it. Some reactions of photosynthesis takes place in the grana and some reactions takes place in the stroma. Mechanism of Photosynthesis Let us try to understand the mechanism of photosynthesis in three major steps. Step 1 The chlorophyll molecule present in the chloroplast absorbs the sunlight and gets activated. Step 2 The light activated chlorophyll splits the water molecule. We know that water molecule is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Now these two are separated by this light activated chlorophyll. This reaction is called photolysis. Step 3 The hydrogen produced in step 2 reacts with carbon dioxide and forms glucose. This is how glucose is made by the plants. But do plants make only glucose in their bodies? No. Apart from glucose, plants also make proteins in their bodies. Plants need nitrogen to make new protein molecules. Plants get this nitrogen from the soil. Nitrogen is present in the soil in the form of nitrites and nitrates. But from where do these nitrites and nitrates reach the soil? The nitrogen fixing bacteria present in the soil converts the atmospheric nitrogen into nitrites and nitrates. This is all about nutrition in plants. Now let us see the heterotropic nutrition. Heterotropic nutrition 
Heterotrophic nutrition involves obtaining ready-made organic food by consuming other organisms. Heterotrophic organisms cannot synthesize their own food and depend on the organic matter produced by autotrophs or other heterotrophs. There are various modes of heterotrophic nutrition. 1. Holozoic nutrition 2. Saprophytic nutrition and 3. Parasitic nutrition Holozoic nutrition this type of nutrition involves the ingestion of solid organic material which is then broken down and absorbed by the organism. Most animals including humans exhibit holozoic nutrition. Holozoic nutrition involves ingestion, digestion, absorption, assimilation and digestion of food. Saprophytic nutrition Organisms that obtain their nutrients from dead and decaying organic matter are called saprophytes. They secrete enzymes onto the dead matter to break it down into simpler substances which they can absorb. Fungi and certain bacteria exhibit saprophytic nutrition. Parasitic nutrition Parasites are organisms that live in or on other organism and they derive their nutrients from their host. Parasitic nutrition is commonly observed in various species of plants, animals and in microorganisms. Holozoic nutrition in single-celled organism Amoeba Amoeba has no fixed shape, so it takes in food from any point on its body surface. Amoeba grabs food using finger-like extensions and forms a food vacuole. Inside this vacuole, the food breaks down into simpler substances that go into the cell. Anything left undigested is pushed out of the cell. In other single-celled organisms like in paramecium, it has a specific shape and the food is taken at one particular spot. Tiny hair-like structures called cilia helps in moving the food to this spot for ingestion. Nutrition in Human Beings Food enters our body through mouth. Our digestive system begins with mouth and ends with anus. Different parts of the digestive tract are arranged like a long coil tube. This tube is called alimentary canal. Accessory glands like liver, pancreas and salivary glands are attached to the alimentary canal and forms the digestive system. The food inside the mouth is made into a soft paste by the action of teeth and saliva. Saliva is a fluid that makes the food soft and wet. Saliva has an enzyme called as salivary amylase. It digests the starch partially. The food is well chewed in the mouth and it passes down into the stomach through esophagus. The rhythmic contractions of the esophagus help the downward movement of the food. These rhythmic contractions are called peristaltic movements. This is stomach. It is a hollow muscular organ. Gastric glands present in the walls of the stomach produce gastric juice. This gastric juice has different compounds in it. These compounds help the stomach to digest the food. Let us see the different components of this gastric juice. Gastric juice has pepsin, hydrochloric acid and mucus in it. Pepsin is a protein digesting enzyme. The medium of the stomach should be acidic for the proper action of this pepsin. So, the medium of the stomach is made acidic by hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. It can cause damage to the stomach walls. A thick layer of mucus protects the walls of the stomach from the action of HCl. At the end of the stomach, there is a muscular sphincter called as pyloric sphincter. This sphincter releases the partly digested food slowly into the small intestine. Small intestine is the longest part of the alimentary canal. It is highly coiled to fit in less space. Pancreas secretes the pancreatic juice, intestinal glands secrete intestinal juice and liver secretes bile juice into the small intestine. Pancreatic juice and intestinal juice have enzymes like trypsin, lipase, pancreatic amylase, peptidases and nucleases. 
These enzymes help in the digestion of carbohydrates, fats and proteins. The bile juice that comes from liver does two important jobs. One, emulsification of fats means converting the bigger fat droplets into smaller fat droplets. By doing this, the surface area of the fat droplets increases. Due to the increased surface area, enzymes can digest these fat droplets more efficiently. The second job of bile is to make the intestinal pH alkaline. In the small intestine, alkaline medium is required for the digestion of carbohydrates. The digestion of food gets completed in the small intestine. In the complete process of digestion, carbohydrates are converted to sugars, proteins are converted to amino acids, fats are converted to fatty acid and glycerol. Absorption of Nutrients The nutrients that are formed in the process of digestion are absorbed into the blood circulatory system. The absorption of nutrients takes place in the small intestine. The wall of this small intestine has numerous finger-like projections on its inner surface. These finger-like projections are called villi. Blood vessels and lymph vessels are present inside these villi. Nutrients get absorbed into these vessels and enters the bloodstream. Undigested food enters into the large intestine. The water present in this undigested food is absorbed into the blood. The remaining undigested waste is excreted out through anus. This is all about nutrition.